<sighs> another weekend, another super video. Here we go. Ugh. Oh, Yamamura, what the fuck? It's Takahashi time. For years I have spoken time and time again about my distaste for Tadayoshi Yamamura's modern character designs. They are the primary source for Dragon Ball's current aesthetic that so many fans dislike. The bubbly faces, nonsensical highlights and bland expressions are just a few of the complaints levied at modern Dragon Ball. Things typically look flat and lack the somewhat grounded approach much of Dragon Ball Z possessed. While that's fine if you're pushing for a softer look a la Pokemon Sun and Moon, or even just Toriyama's modern approach, it becomes a major issue when you ride that line and no longer resemble the old or respect the new. That is Tadayoshi Yamamura in a nutshell, and despite his improvements over the past year, it feels like any Stockholm Syndrome that developed has been entirely eradicated thanks to episode 114. With Naoki Tate, you get a soft interpretation of modern Toriyama, and in episode 16 of Super, we saw Shuichi Iseki attempt to channel some of the classic design decisions found in Dragon Ball Z. The latter I called the golden standard for modern Dragon Ball, because despite classic features like indented cheek shading, detailed ears and arching eyes, it still felt fresh and allowed for some very expressive drawings. It has been two years since that episode and I never ever thought something would top those designs. Yuichi Kurosawa at his best came close but his issues with feature placement let him down. Masahiro Shimanuki's return to form has been wonderful and incredibly nostalgic but again his troubles with proportions don't don't quite make him the ideal candidate. But here we are, it is episode 114 and this is the debut of Yuya Takahashi as an animation supervisor and oh my god, the king has arrived, it is perfect. Let's touch on exactly what it is about Takahashi's art that has caused the internet to kind of explode over the past 24 hours and proclaim that Dragon Ball Z is back. First and foremost, let's kick things off with a look at the shape of the eyes. Back on the older series, the eyes themselves tended to arch, which not only helped avoid flattening the image, they made for great expressions. In the current designs, the eyes are typically drawn with a flat bottom, regardless of whether they're angled or not, they're usually just a very square shape either way. Takahashi has entirely done away with this in favour of channeling the older approach. There are hints of classic Yamamuro here, especially with the little specks drawn on the edges of the eyebrows. Similarly, the eyebrows themselves actually curve around the brow into the crease, which adds so much depth. It reminds me a lot of Naoto Shishida's classic uncorrected work from movie 8. The next part that stood out to me, and this has been one of my huge pet peeves in the current designs, is the nose. The current approach is a simplified take on the older noses, but it always kind of looked like a gaping hole in the middle of faces to me. Thankfully, Takahashi brings things back to the way they were, properly paying attention to the perspective of the face and only suggesting the underside where necessary. Likewise, in the three quarter views, the often rounded noses are now sharp and slant down the face, Quite nicely. I think what I love most though, and this is only emphasised by the shading that we'll touch on later, is the actual form of the characters. Facially, Yamamuro typically draws quite wide and undefined faces, which when combined with his curved cheek shading, is what leads to that bubbly look that you often hear fans cite. Takahashi is very much doing his own thing here. The jaw is much longer, therefore making the face slimmer, and the slight curve inwards on the far side of the face, and especially the forehead, does wonders for avoiding those pitfalls. 
In terms of the body, I really love the return to defined pecs. In recent years, Yamamuro has decided to return to simply showcasing the collarbone and hinting at the pecs below. That's not the worst approach in the world, I guess, but it has meant that colorists have mistaken it for a shirt many, many times. By defining the pecs, you also get to add really defined anterior deltoid muscles, which to me is one of those things that has always defined Dragon Ball bodies. Toriyama used to do it, and I was always so sad to see it go. It did a great job of convincing fans they were staring at truly jacked characters. Lastly, the shading, and like pretty much every aspect so far, Takahashi is doing a great job of channeling the older designs. Facially, you can see he's avoided Yamamura's usual choice of having a straight line up the side of the face, instead opting to use curved shading that defines the cheekbones. This is one of those things that other animators have noticed adds huge depth to the face. Shimanuki and Nashizawa both use it, for example. Takahashi's kind of made it his own though. In the original Super Saiyan 3 designs, there was an extra darker layer that was often added to the cheek to indicate another plane, which stopped it looking quite so sharp. Takahashi has taken this and applied it to pretty much all scenarios, and I think it works really nicely. There are so many aspects of Takahashi's work here that show just how clearly this man understands Dragon Ball's design history. I've mentioned most of them, but of course there's also things like the larger Super Saiyan hair which is nice and flowy, instead of looking like Lego. There's more defined features on side characters like Krillin and Kaba, which does wonders for helping them look their age. You can just see how much love has gone into this episode, and you don't just have to take my word for it. Over the past few months, Takahashi has been tweeting a whole bunch of practice drawings to do with Dragon Ball, and it looks like it really paid off. Looking at his character art back on episode 13 of Super under Yamamuro's supervision, the difference is pretty astounding. Whether that's the result of being overcorrected or simply developing this style in the recent months, I don't know, but it's impossible not to notice how night and day they are. I've spent this entire video so far talking about Takahashi's phenomenal art, and I haven't even touched on the actual movement or anyone else yet. The opening scene of the episode was animated by Takahashi, we're back to Takahashi, and it's a great way to kick things off. This episode is really well storyboarded, which I wasn't actually expecting, so these great angles mixed with his lovely animation go so well together. His timing is lovely, especially the part where Goku punches away the debris. The first half, however, is supervised by Toei Animation Philippines, and while Miyako Suji is here to tidy up their work, even she sticks out like a very sore thumb. Thankfully, Yuichi Kurosawa is here to save the day and he is doing key animation. His style is honestly so perfect to go along with Takahashi's. Their shading is very similar, and while Kurosawa certainly has issues with feature placements on the human-looking characters, he blends very well and I really enjoyed his work on Frieza and Kato Pezra. He draws muscles so, so well. In the second half, this is where Takahashi's supervision takes over, and he really is everywhere. That's a wonderful thing, but it does make it a little hard to tell who's who. Goku vs. Cauliflower and Kale in the first few minutes of the half does seem to be by Atsushi Nikaido, and I believe he also does the long shot packed with smears after the god transformation. Kenji Miura pops up for the close-up fights in this part, and the bits where Cauliflower is running around the stadium, finishing up with Kale saving her, where you can see Miura's distinctive smoke from back in episode 112. Takahashi animates the Kamehameha but that's kind of it in terms of actual animation. There was definitely a focus on storyboarding and artwork in this episode over anything else, and I'm kind of okay with that in this case. I think it very much goes along with the nostalgia vibes from the artwork. Dragon Ball Z, after all, was very similar. It did not have much truly great movements on the whole, but because of its pretty exemplary character art from some of the supervisors, a lot of people come away thinking they saw something better than they did. I think that's the case here too. I've seen a lot of people calling this the best animated episode of Super ever, and that's just not even close to the truth. It is far and away the best when it comes to character art, but realistically, the animation itself is still pretty limited, and that's why I've put such an emphasis on the absolutely spectacular artwork for this video. I really, really hope Takahashi will become a regular of sorts, but he is a freelancer and not exclusive to Toei, so unfortunately that's not guaranteed. At the very least, we will of course see him again at some point, I'm sure he does have pretty deep ties to the studio after all, 
personally, I would love to see him become a character designer, but that's probably unrealistic. So I'm going to end this video here and go daydream about a reality where that's a thing. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to rate the video and let me know how much you enjoy Takahashi's work here. The upcoming staff lists for the next month of Super will be here soon, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my breakdowns on what to expect from Super's visuals over the next month. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.